Well, today I'm going to bum out you husbands. No, we're going to we're going to spend time in the Word, looking at the role of the Christian husband. And as mentioned a moment ago, I'm actually going to use two very basic passages that we find in the New Testament, though I allude to other scriptures from the Old. But I'll be looking at two passages, uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, I'm going to look at that, and uh, try to develop some practical aspects of being a Christian husband out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 25 to verse 33. And so what I normally do is I will lay a, a foundation, then I go into some practical application. So let's begin reading together Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, and then uh, I'll lay a foundation and we'll look at some things out of uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, and I'll, I will return to, uh, to Ephesians 5. So let me begin reading at verse 25 in Ephesians 5. I'll read to verse 33, and we'll get into our study. The Apostle Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we're going to be looking this morning at the topic of Christian husbands. And when you begin right from, from the start, we need to know that there are some men who seem to be more prepared for marriage than others. A woman once said, I think men who have a pierced ear are better prepared for marriage. They've experienced pain and have bought jewelry. And so there are some men, apparently, who are more prepared to get married. As we look at this topic, we need to know that God designed marriage, and God designed marriage in such a way for the uh, husbands to enact a leadership role in the home and in the marriage. And the role finds its origin not in some man's invention to enslave women, but rather it's intended to ensure order in a home. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul had said, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So it's intended by God to be led by men, but though intended by God for men to lead, some husbands have a difficult time doing so. And there are various reasons that you'll see. There are, there are some wives, for example, who simply refuse to be led because they consider themselves to be more capable. There are some wives who have been leading for so long that by yielding their power, well, they don't want to do that because yielding their power would be much too difficult. Uh, that does create tension, especially when the husband wants to, to lead. Uh, sometimes in frustration, the husband might try to force his leadership on the wife, and that doesn't do any good at all. It just creates tension. There are some husbands who don't know how to lead. Uh, they didn't get trained to lead properly. They had no father or perhaps had improper leadership role models. And so they really don't know about leading a home, a home. And there are husbands who are afraid sometimes to take the lead because they're afraid to fail. They may be afraid to fail, so they don't want uh, to try. Or they may be concerned about the struggles that leadership requires. Because leading the wife and leading the home isn't the easiest thing to do. There are more than a few men who just don't want to make decisions, and thus they leave the decision-making up to the wife. It's more comfortable for them to do that. They, they think, oh, why rock the boat? Well, I remember a man who said, I haven't spoken to my wife in 18 months. 
I don't like to interrupt her. Well, so they don't want to rock the boat. It, it, it remains that God has vested in men the responsibility of leadership in the home. And that's something that God holds us as husbands accountable for. In, in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verse 8, uh, Paul said, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So as is true in all biblical leadership, uh, it's a position that is maintained through love. And that's seen in other passages relating to husband and wife relationships. I mentioned 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. In that, in that verse, Peter gives instructions to Christian husbands. And this is what he writes. He says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So he gives some very basic instructions to husbands. He first begins by instructing them to dwell with their wives. That word dwell is a Greek word that means to intimately cohabit with them. Dwelling speaks of living with your wife in such a way as it causes her to know that you enjoy, you enjoy being with her. We need to, as husbands, make sure that we know the difference between a house and a home. I was in maybe third grade, and our teacher asked the question of a class. Our teacher asked the question, what is the difference between a house and a home? Well, I'm a little boy. I have no clue about definitions of house and home. For me, they were basically the same, so I had no opinion on that. But I'll never forget a little girl in the class who's, who answered the question in this way. She said, a house is where people live. A home is where a family lives. And I think that was a very good definition, and I've, I've kept that in the back of my mind all of these years. And husbands need to know the difference between a house and a home. So as a husband, we need to refuse uh, to turn our, our home into a motel. We need to refuse turning it into a shop or an off-site work office. We need to dwell in that home. We need to make it into a home, intimately cohabit in that home. Now, we also need to dwell with our wives with, he says, understanding. When he says dwell with them with understanding, we need to get to know her. Like, like when you were first dating, you, you take an active interest in your wife. You, you take an active interest in her, in her life. You try to understand her. That's a, that can be a task. There are two times when a man doesn't understand a woman before marriage. And after marriage, I mean, it takes a lot of work to get to understand one another. And yet, when you observe, when you are actually making the home into a home, when you're taking an active interest, then you begin to learn the things that are pleasing to her and the things that are not pleasing to her. And you begin to make adjustments and, and you begin to, to yield parts of yourself up so that so the things that make her happy that are proper in the Lord are things that you find a joy in doing. And that's what we do as husbands. We begin to dwell with them with understanding. We listen to her when she speaks. We hear the things that she likes. We hear the things that she doesn't like. We, we learn those things. Her friends, we, we learn her history. We learn about her family. We learn about all of those things. While we're dating, we should be interested and we should continue that after we get married. It's something that you don't ever really learn completely. It's something that's an ongoing thing. So when you dwell with them according to knowledge, you're taking an active interest in her. So we make that effort to know her personal needs. We make that effort to know what's going on in the home. We learn to be considerate towards her. We take a genuine interest in her. I make her the focus of my studies. And, and what's a good thing about that is when I do that kind of thing, she knows she's valued, and I'm actually securing my home against predators. I'm securing her, and I'm securing her love. You see, uh, I, I make sure that I have no interests outside of the home that will take me away from her. I, I don't allow intrusions that diminish her importance uh, to me. I, I, I am very careful to restrict outside distractions and, and to concentrate more on her and, and what it is that goes into making the two of us one. 
Distractions that, that take from the marriage instead of building it up are, are left outside. So that means hobbies and work, outside activities that eliminate her should be kept at a minimum. You know, before Marie and I got married, I played a lot of softball. That was a, that was a sport that I enjoyed the most. And, and while we were dating, I was still playing on, on three different teams a, a week. You know, I played a lot of softball. I played softball in the military. I played a lot of baseball prior to that. So for me, the sport of choice that I enjoyed the most was playing softball. So I played it a lot. And Marie, when she was dating, me would come to softball games. And even after we, we, we married, I still played for a number of years on softball teams, and she would come. And I can still remember a guy that used to play on one of the teams I was on. It was a church team. I was the assistant pastor at that time, and he was playing on, this, on the church team. And and uh, he played a lot of softball and all. And one day his wife walked up to me and she said, you know, the only time I ever see my husband is when I come to the softball games because he's in a lot of, on a lot of teams and he plays all the time. And I said, your husband plays a lot of softball? She says, yeah, and the time that I will see him and, and our kids see my husband is when I come to the games. And, and even at that time, this is many years ago, I thought, that's a bad thing. That's not, that's not going to be good and, and all, but... I kind of put that away and never really approached it until years later here at this fellowship uh, that that same man walks up to me and he says to me, do you remember me? And I'm looking at him and it had been a number of years and I said, I, I do. I, didn't we play softball together? And he goes, yeah. I said, how are you? He says, my wife divorced me. And I'll never forget that. When she had told me that the only time she ever saw him was when she took the kids to watch him play ball. And so be very careful, husbands, that you don't have things that take your interests away from your home. Make sure that you dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Make sure that you take an active interest in her, in her life. Make sure that you remain faithful. Don't allow anything to take you away. Don't allow intrusions to diminish your importance. Restrict those things. As a Christian husband, I want my wife to be blessed by the Lord. And by restricting distractions, I can concentrate on developing a good relationship with her. You see, if we're going to make it to the end, we need to walk in the same direction. So that means that we'll have many opportunities to get to know one and over, over a lifetime. Amos in chapter 3, verse 3, asks the question, can two walk together? And then he goes on to say, unless they are agreed so make sure that you spend time observing and caring for your wife. Uh, Peter also instructs husbands to give honor to the wife. That means to assign dignity. And the way you assign dignity to her is you, it's the way you treat her. It's how you speak to her. It's how you speak of her, especially in front of other people. Assigning honor speaks of lifting her up instead of running her down. The way I speak to my wife encourages or diminishes her personal value. So we should tell her things that she, she should hear. We should tell her how much we love her. We should tell her how beautiful she is to us. And we should tell her how much we value her. Now, I'll be honest with you, that's not something I was especially good at when we first got married. That wasn't even something that I was good at when we were dating. I mean, saying I love you, that wasn't something I was comfortable with. People who come to this church now uh, know that I'm real open about my feelings and all uh, about my wife. But what you don't know is that I wasn't like that always. You can learn to open up. You can learn to speak these things. It's, it wasn't something that I did naturally or easily. It, it, it wasn't something I, I felt comfortable doing for whatever reason. I, I can still remember when I was dating Marie, I can still remember, uh, I, I didn't say I love you. I mean, I didn't even hold her hand for five months. I, I, I mean, I, I, I just was like one of these hands-off kinds of guys, and I wasn't verbal or anything like that and, and all. And, and I can still remember when I started thinking, I, I care about this woman. I, I actually am developing a love for her, but I, I, didn't, I didn't really want to say it. So one day I asked her, I said to her, uh, Marie, I said, let me ask you a question. And she said, okay. I said, uh, do you love me? She looks at me. Yes, I do. And I said, oh. 
And then she says, do you love me? I really did. I just looked at her and I go, I don't know. I don't know. I, you want to get worse? Okay, I'll get worse. Um, I asked her one day, true story, I asked her one day, Marie, if I were to ask you to marry me, would you? She said, yes, I would. I said, good. If I ever ask you, I now know the answer. I was I wasn't asking her, I was just curious. I mean, there's, see, so I, I had, you can hate me, it's, but it's true. I mean, I, so guys, I'm talking to the men. Women, tune out for a minute. <laughs> Fellas, you know, sometimes, because I'm an open-hearted man, sometimes people think I've always been. Now, it's easy for you to do, Pastor David. No, it's not. It never has been. It was something I died to. It's something I learned to do. It's something I asked God to help me with because I, I'm not by nature, meaning my old nature, a real effusive, open, I'm not that way. That isn't me. I had to discover by observing my wife, dwelling with her according to knowledge, that she's not an insecure woman and she's not less it just blesses her to know the man she has given her life to loves her. And I had to learn that. I had to learn that. When we would, we would go, even to this day, when we would go and she, she, she is going to go into a, a shop to buy something, I'll be honest with you. I mean, at the beginning, it was much more open. But we'd go and she, I'd ha I felt like I was in purgatory. I'd have to go into a dress shop or whatever. And it's, that's uncomfortable. And I'm just sitting there on the timeout seat with all the other husbands like, hey, guys, let's make a break. You know, we can make it. We can get out of here. They don't know where we're at. But I would sit there, you know, and she'd come out and she'd have something on. And she would say, what do you think? And I would, and this is the truth. I mean, early days, some of you know what I'm saying. She'd say, what do you think? And I'd say, what does it matter? I said, I'm not wearing that. You are. I might once in a while when you're not home, but no, I, I'm, not, I'm not wearing that. And I mean, I'm just kind of like open. And I say, I, I don't wear, do you like it? It's not to me. If you, and I'd say, look, at, when I go buy some jeans, I don't put them on and walk around, you know. They're jeans, you know, you put them on, you wear them. That's the way it works. Why are you asking me these things? And it took a long time for the Holy Spirit to finally break through and say to me, it's because she's buying that, not for herself, because she wants to please you. Because she wants to please you. And I go, bingo. <laughs> Never got it. Then I learned, if I say the first thing that she puts on is great, I don't have to sit there any longer. I'm out. <laughs> Learn from an old man. Learn from the master. But I had to discover these things, and so are you. You know, there are things that may not matter to you. They just, it, it just isn't important to you. But these are things that are important to her. And so I, I, I learned these things, and I'm learning these things. I, I want her to know how loved she is, and therefore, I've learned to say I love you. I've learned to say, no, I already did, and I've, I had that sense, but, but I learned to vocalize that, to verbalize that. I learned to say to my wife, I think you're the most beautiful woman in the world. I, I've learned to tell her every day, every day, how much I appreciate her in one form or another. Why? Because I do feel these things, and I know that she is blessed when she hears them. And what I'm doing is I'm lifting her up. I'm assigning honor to her. I'm, I'm, I'm showing her that she is loved. Uh, I, I, I speak of her in a certain way, and I encourage her. I don't want to diminish her. And, and therefore, I say these things. Now, notice also in, in the verse that I read to you that the Apostle Peter refers to her as a weaker vessel. That doesn't speak of inferiority. It speaks of the obvious physical differences. And he's basically simply saying something we'll see in a moment with Paul when Paul speaks of cherishing and nourishing. He's saying, treat her gently. 
Don't verbally or physically bully her. Don't abuse her. Remember that some wives come from homes where verbal or physical abuse was common. So remember that and treat her with tenderness. Love her. Treat her like a lady. Treat her as if she's the most important person in your life. Treat her lovingly. And be careful not to throw past sins into her face. Remember, you can get upset, and before you know it, you're saying things you ought not to say. Be aware of that, because your words can be reckless. And Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We need to understand, as a husband, that we are a sinner just like our wives. We're both saved by grace, and we need to realize that we are one. And as a team, we're going to stand together or we're going to fall together. And as such, I have an awareness that my wife is actually the truest expression of real ministry. She's the greatest reflection and open expression of my walk with the Lord. My father taught me, and, and again, my father never lectured me. I, I have to say it this way. My dad wasn't the man who sat the son down and said, son, I have these things to instruct you. And my dad didn't do that. But my dad taught me by his example, and I would watch my father as sons do. And I watched the way that my father was with my mom. I noted that as a young boy growing into a, a young man, I, I never saw my father ever look at another woman in an inappropriate way, never. I never saw my father allow another woman outside of family members ever get close to him. No friends of our family ever hugged my father. My father never allowed them to kiss him, even a kiss of greeting on the cheek. My dad wasn't that way. My dad was a one-woman man. I never had any sense in my life that my father was ever untrue to my mom. I knew from the time I was young until my father went home to be with the Lord that my father loved my mother with every beat of his heart. As a matter of fact, the last time I know of his prayer life, and I've said this before, but the last prayer that I know my father ever prayed was when he had a heart attack that, that took his life. He, he, that was his ticket to heaven. And when he had that heart attack, and I went to his house because my mom called me actually to the hospital. Uh, my mom had called and said, your dad had a heart attack. David, can you come to the hospital? And Marie and I went to the hospital. I can still remember when I walked in, my mom said, Daddy had a heart attack. And, um, and do you know what he did? And I said, what? And my mom said, he prayed. And I said, really? And she said, do you know what he prayed? And I said, no. And my, la my dad's last prayer that I know was, Father, take care of my wife. That was my dad. So there was only one woman in his life. So he never lectured me about that. One of the last things my father ever said to me that I can remember prior to his heart attack was when he was just visiting with me one day, and he said this. I'll never forget this. He said, David, your wife, you've got a good woman. And when my father said something like that, that was the top. That was, that was the best thing that he could say. And he said that about my wife. But I still remember that as he looked at me and he said, David, you've got a good woman. You see, when I was a young man, Marie and I and my mom and dad were going someplace. We stopped at a store for a moment. We went into the store. My dad was purchasing something. I was standing with him. And there was a man and his wife standing right in front of us. And when they rang him up, the guy pulled his wallet out and he paid. And they put his, his uh, groceries in a, in a bag. And I'm standing right behind him. He was an older guy, close to my dad's age. And I'm standing behind this guy when the guy pays. And the wife gathers up the groceries. And she walks out carrying them while he walks in front of her. And I'm watching him do that. And then we went out right behind him, and he's walking down the street. And the woman's about two or three paces behind him, carrying the bags of groceries, the bag of groceries. And I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at this woman carrying the groceries. And I turn to my dad, and I say to my dad, Dad, I want to thank you. And my father says, for what? I said, for never treating my mother like that man's treating that woman for never treating my mother like that. Thank you. See, my father knew that this was the only love of his life. My father met my mom when he was 20 years old at a dance. My mother was a light-skinned Mexican woman, very light-skinned. And the story goes that my dad was checking her out. My dad was 20 and she was 17. And my dad was checking her out. 
And in Spanish, he was speaking to his friends about, hey, look at her. And so he's talking like that. My mom walks up and speaks Spanish to him and busts him. And that's how they met. <laughs> and he goes, oh, you speak Spanish. He goes, why wouldn't I? You know, blah, blah, blah. And that's how it began. <laughs> my dad couldn't dance. He went to a dance to pick up chicks. And my mom was a dancer. And I can still remember family get-togethers where my dad would stand just doing left, right, left, right, that kind of thing. <laughs> And my mom would dance circles around him, and he would just go like this. I can still remember that. You know, but that was their love. That was it. And my father never had a love for anybody else. I still remember him saying this to me. He said, son, before there was you, there was your mother. And when you leave, there's still your mother. She's number one. My father taught me that. That's how I was raised. That's why I, I, in the Lord, I am a one-woman man. That's why I learned from the best. I learned from a man who loved his wife, from a man who, who, to the end, to his dying prayer, it was for her. You see, and so those things matter. No lectures, just observation. No, you need to do this is just living and loving getting up and working. When he was sick, he still had to bring in money to pay bills. My father would go to work sick. My dad, his name meant everything to him because a man is his name. And my father made sure his bills were paid on time. He made sure his children had shoes put on their feet and a shirt to put on their back. My father made sure that we were cared for, but he had one woman in his life, and that was my mom. So I had a great example of somebody who loved his wife. And he cherished her, and he cared for her, and that's exactly what it means. There was somebody who was talking badly about his wife, and my father turned to me, and this was before my dad was saved, and he said, doesn't that man understand that he's making himself look bad by putting down his wife? And I didn't know what my father was referring to. I got saved, and then I read 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, where Paul said, Woman is the glory of the man. And I came to understand what daddy knew, that a woman is a reflection of your walk with God. My wife is a reflection. She's my most observable ministry. My wife is. I can stand up and speak here, but all you need to do is look at my wife to see whether or not those things are true. I can say all kinds of things here. All you need to do is get to know Marie to know whether or not those things are true. Because I teach about love, and I teach about patience, and I teach about caring, and I teach about prayer. If I teach about those things, all you gotta do is look at my wife, because she's a reflection, because she is really the most observable aspect of my ministry. Anybody who knows my wife, if you know my wife, and I say this because it's true, will know that she's a very loving person. My wife is a very open-hearted, loving woman. She really is. And I don't say that and for any other reason other than it's just it's a simple fact. She really is. And she's always been a great person. I've always, you know, she's, she was sweet the day I met her, and she wasn't even safe. She just was a sweet person. But one of the things you won't know about her if you don't know us is this, is my wife is not open in her affection. She's not an openly affectionate person. And you say, well, wait a minute. If you know Marie, wait a minute. She'll hug me. She kisses me. What are you talking about? How can you say that? Well, let me tell you. When Marie and I were dating, she got saved in my Bible study. And me, I'm a Jesus freak. I'm a young man. And, and I was taught, you know, that love is the mark of a believer. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another, Jesus said. And so in the Jesus movement, we were really inculcated with this attitude of learning to love other people. That had been a prayer in my life from the day I got saved. And, and now I've met this young lady. She came to my Bible study, got saved three weeks into it. And now she's seated at, at literally seated at my feet when I would teach. And all, all of that. And so she started to learn the word of God and she was hungry for it. But Marie is very closed you know, and, and she's, she's a matter-of-fact kind of person. Our very first date, I still remember two things she told me on our very first date. The first thing she told me, she said, first, I want you to know, my name is Marie. It isn't Mary, and it's not Maria. 
My name is Marie. I still remember she's looking at me all hard and this and that. You know, my name is, my name is Marie. I call her Maria to this day just because it irritates her. Now, you better not, but I do. So that's one of the things. The second thing she told me was, if I get stung by a bee, get me to the hospital immediately because I am very, very allergic to bee stings. Those are the first two converse, parts of our first date conversation that we ever had. Now, Marie is real warm and, and, and all, but not affectionate. And so one day, now we've been dating for a while, one day, something happened. I, I don't remember what, but something had caused her to, to tear up. And when she began to tear up, I, I'm a nurturing kind of person, and so, so I put my arms around her to, to try and comfort her. And Marie put her hands on my chest and pushed me, pushed me away. She says, I don't like to be touched when I'm upset. And I said, really? Really? So I grabbed her and I held her tighter. And I said, you need to be hugged because you know what? You need, you need love right now. And now that worked in our marriage for her to be able to accept affection, to be able to accept that it's okay to be nurtured and cared for because that was not part of her. So what you see with my wife, with her kindness and all, my influence, and I don't say that with weirdness, I'm speaking as a husband, my influence in my wife has helped that to be part of her life so that she is loving and open and caring because the Lord has taught me to be that. And we together are that way. And she is the glory of the man. I can see your ministry, husband. I can see your ministry by talking to your wife. I can see your ministry when I talk to your wife. Somebody who says, oh, I want to teach the word, I will look to your wife. Because if she knows the word, if she's loved and loving, I'll know you're having an impact. But if I see that there's something about her that is reluctant or wounded, you know what? It's true, and I don't mean this to sound wrong. It's just an illustration. But you could even know when a, when a dog is, is, is neglected. You know even when an animal is. How much more so a human being? And you can see that. And so your real ministry, husband, is your wife. It's your wife, because that's what God called me as a husband to do, is to encourage her in her walk with Jesus Christ so that she knows him. That is my job. You see, according to verse 7 of 1 Peter 3, we are heirs together of the grace of life. She's not less than me. We're equal before God. We're heirs together. We equally share in the need and of the grace of God. And so I encourage her, her walk in the Lord. And I also want to be the man that she respects. You see, Paul says that in verse 33 of chapter 5 here, when he says, let the wife see that she respects her husband. And I've already said this, but I want to be the man in her life. And I've made it my aim. And maybe, maybe some of you guys will think, oh, this is weird. I don't even want to hear. I'm I'm turning you off, man. What are you talking about? You're like a sissified man. Because there are a lot of guys who think that about me, and, and I'm okay with that. I'll hit you with my purse. No, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I don't care. You know, as long as my wife cares, and my wife is nurtured, that's what matters to me. But I'm telling you this, that love and that affection and that tenderness and that care has made her a very happy woman, a very blessed woman because she has the kind of man that wants her to have those things. And I made, it, I made it my goal. Husband, I hope you're doing the same for your wife. I made it my goal to be the most important man outside of Jesus in her life. I made that my goal. That's my chief aim, for her to look at me and say, there will never be another man that equals this man. That's what I've chosen to do. There are guys who want to have the fastest car. They want to run the fastest, be the strongest. And that's fine if that's what you want for your goal. But for mine, I want my wife to say within herself, there will never be another man like this. This is the number one man. In reality, everybody needs a hero. And outside of Christ, I've chosen to be that for my wife. I want her to say there will never be another that can match this guy here. I will never, never want another person I want this one here. So that's my aim. And how do I do that? I read my Bible. 
I see that that's what a man's role is, to cherish, to nourish, to protect, to care for, to love, to do those things. Why? Because I'm safeguarding her and I'm helping her to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how that works. And so as Peter has said those things, the Apostle Paul says things that complement that. Because notice again, here in chapter 5, that was your introduction. We better get into chapter 5. <laughs> in verse 25 of chapter 5 of Ephesians, notice, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Husbands, love your wives. You might find this interesting that he says this to us. It's not the only place, by the way, where husbands are commanded to love our wives. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 3, he said, let the husband render to his wife the affection that is due her. In Colossians 3, verse 9, 19, he said, husbands, love your wives. Do not be bitter toward them. This isn't the only place that this command is given. It's interesting to note, though, that husbands are commanded to love our wives, but you won't find a similar command from Paul to wives. You won't find a, a command where it says, wives, love your husbands. Now, in Titus, he says, the older women teach the younger women how to love, but he doesn't teach them to love. It's interesting. The wife is created in such a way that she will love but we have other interests that can take us from loving properly. So he begins to tell us how to love. And he gives us several things here as you look at this. The first thing he says is in verse 25, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Now look, and gave himself for her. Love her sacrificially. Love your wife sacrificially. Remember that Jesus laid down his life for us and that love that is modeled by his sacrifice is a model to us as husbands. He laid down his life even, he, even though he knew the majority of people would reject him. You see, sometimes we may lay down our lives and it may not be appreciated. We may think that this will change things because we're laying down our lives. Sometimes it doesn't change anything, so we give up. That means the love that we were manifesting wasn't really sacrificial because we thought we could use it to manipulate change. You see, in marriage, sacrificial love is necessary. It's the ingredient that keeps the marriage together. Now, there are men who have a difficulty with that concept because the idea of surrendering and sacrifice, well, that's not something men are ready to do. Not completely. It's possible that as a young kid, they, they learned that the one who loves the least retains the greatest control. And that's true in relationships. If, if a guy is loved more by the girl, well, then he can get away with being a, a creep. If the girl is loved by the guy more, then she can get away with hurting him because he'll just keep coming back. So you'll learn that principle. The one who loves least is in control. And so some guys just are unwilling to yield themselves in that way because they're trying to manipulate and control. But the essence of love is self-denial. And real love holds nothing back from the one that is loved. In John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So we need to see the value of consistently laying down our lives for our wives. You see, it's not the enormous, dangerous things that, that will undermine our marriage. It's the small things that are left unsaid and undone that erode its foundations. In the Song of Solomon, in chapter 2, verse 15, we read that it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. And so we need to learn to love and to yield ourselves, to, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We say to our girlfriends, we want to make the best impression when we're dating them. And so we tell them, I'll do anything for you. You just ask. If you're thirsty, I'll walk across the desert barefoot just to get you a glass of water, baby. And then you get married. And she says, throw the trash. And you say, are you kidding me? Who's sitting on your lap? You know, we change. We change. It's the small things that we do daily that matter not the large things. 
It's the small everyday things that we learn to yield uh, just to keep the peace and sometimes just to make them happy. And it's the little things that can destroy. So we have to be careful with that. So we love, and we learn to love sacrificially. We put ourselves aside so that we can care for her. And no, she's not going to take advantage of us. She's going to appreciate it. A second thing in verse 26 is that he says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. The purpose of God's love towards us is to cleanse us, to make us beautiful for him. We're his bride. The church is to be sanctified. It's to be cleansed. It's to be without spot or wrinkle. We are holy and without blemish. So you know that before a bride was married, she would go through a time of purifying and cleansing. The bride would, would bathe, uh, and costly perfumes and ointments would be applied to her. That was done to purify and to prepare her for her husband. And they would refer to this bride as the one who has been set apart. She was the one who was cleansed and purified. And, and that's a picture of the church, purified and cleansed. And that happens to the word. So it's not simply an outward beauty that he's speaking about. He's speaking of that inward beauty that's produced, he says, by the washing of the water of the word. So the word cleanses us because the word provides forgiveness for sin. Just like it says in John 15, 3, you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. So it's through the washing of the word that we are cleansed and we become his bride. But there's another application that is considered. I want you to see this. Paul speaks of sanctified and cleansed by the washing of water by the word. Interestingly, the Greek word translated word is rema. The word rema is used to refer to the spoken word. It, 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 it can be used to describe an utterance. It's often thought of as what we would call a word for that moment. So that gives to me some insight into the husband's spiritual influence. When he says that she is washed by the water, by the word, it, it refers to me, it can be applied in this way, that I have been called by God to spiritually lead the home. And when I speak the things of the Lord to my wife, my life should line up closely to his written word so that when I'm speaking to her and I'm saying this is what the Lord has laid on my heart, that my wife will respect the word of God as it's flowing from her husband to her, the utterance of God's word to her. And this is where a lot of husbands and wives have real problems, especially if the wife is a woman of the word of God. If the husband thinks it's better for her to be in a small group, for her to go to a conference, for her to be in a retreat, because after all, he's working and he's providing food for the table, he's mis misunderstanding something because the more she gets into the word, the more she's going to expect him to lead her. And when he neglects that, he loses his spiritual authority. And when he loses his spiritual authority, at that point, she stops respecting his spirituality. And so what I'm called as a husband to be is the one who speaks that word to the, of the Lord to my wife because my wife will listen to me as I properly, properly represent the kingdom of God. Now, this is a Christian concept. We're talking about a Christian husband. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about Christians. And if you're single right now, you need to understand this and you need to grow in this because if you get married without having a prophetic mantle, if you will, having a prophetic sense about you, a knowledge of God, a sense of his spirit, then the woman you marry, if she has a heart for God, is going to become starved because you're unable to lead her. It's a very important thing for you as a man to take the chance to learn God's word and give, you, give God's word. Now, in my relationship with Marie, uh, those in this church already know this, she came to a Bible study I was teaching in Ontario. She got saved, I think, three weeks into the study. My sister Madeline led her to Christ. Marie has never known me in any other capacity other than what you see me to be now, many years later. This is how she knows me. Does that mean I've always been the same man in terms of my, my, my maturity? Of course not. She, she met a young Christian. I was, I was young in the Lord when I met her. I was just learning the things of the Lord. And yet I was trying to teach and grow that way. So no, I, I didn't have the knowledge and experience of maturity that I have now. No, of course not. 
but you can grow. Here's the thing, don't give up on growing. Don't give up on growing. You go to work out, you go to work out. And you go and you look at the weights and you say to yourself, I could pick that up. And you get down there, we'll say you're bench pressing. You get down and you say, put some weights on. Say, well, you know what, this is a couple hundred pounds. I weigh 200 myself, I can pick up my own weight. And then it crushes you. <laughs> you have this big crease in your chest. What happened? Well, you, you, you esteemed yourself highly than, more highly than you ought. So what do you do? You have to start with a lighter weight. Why? Because you have to build up. You build up. You start out with whatever you can handle. You do your reps. You work out. The next day you say, I ain't never going to do that again. You can't lift your arms up. You walk like, I can't do that any again. And then you give yourself a day to heal and you go again. And you start again. Well, if you do that for a month, two months, three, four, five months, when you're into your six-month regular routine, you start actually saying, hey, you know what, I'm, a I'm actually handling this. I'm actually growing stronger. And at one point, you were lifting 100 pounds. You know, in six months, you're 150, 200 pounds. You're working out, and you're actually, but it takes time. Why do we think that spiritual life is, is going to happen overnight? So you leave a church service like this, and you say, yeah, I'm going to be the man of the house. I'm going to be the spiritual leader. And then tonight, you're about to go to bed, and the spirit, Spirit's going to say, pray with your wife. And you're going to say, well, I'm watching afterwards, but I've got to get up early. We'll start tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You start now. You start now. And I've been working out in this way for a long time. And I started out with this mindset, I will lead. I will be the man God wants me to be. Again, listen, I have failed more times than I would admit. God knows. God knows. And my wife does. I have failed. I am not the great Christian I want to be. But I'm not what I used to be either. And what happens is you grow. You grow. And you go, amen. Thank you for the overwhelming applause. But that's what I'm being blown off this stage with it. But that's what happens. Start now. Don't start next week. Don't start next month. Don't start next time. Start now. Say, I'm going to be that man. I'm going to do that. I will be that. And you will. Because that's a prayer God will answer. I have been praying for 47 years, at least, almost 48, that God would teach me to love, that he would teach me how to love. I, that's the one thing I don't do well, the one thing I don't do well that I'll admit to, is I don't know how to love, and I know that. So I ask God every day, help me. Help me to learn to love. I've been praying that since I was a brand new Christian because that's the mark of a Christian. I want to be a loving man. Now, I don't want to be a weak person. I don't want to be an effeminate man. I want to be a man. Jesus Christ, who would say he wasn't a man? Jesus Christ walks into a temple twice and he looks around. It's my father's house. You've made it into a den of thieves. Get some whip. Whack, whack, whack. Out they go. He was a man. Everywhere he went, he walked. And he was a mason as well as a carpenter. He would work with stone, and he worked with, with, uh, with wood. That's what Jesus did. The word carpenter means a mason as well as working with wood. He didn't go to Bethlehem lumber to get some two-by-fours. He went out to a, to a forest. He cut down, and he shaped. He did it with his hands. He did it with his hands. He would get splinters. He had calluses. His legs were strong. His back was strong. Jesus was a powerful man, and he knew how to carry himself. And yet he was the same man who would pick up a baby and hold the baby. And, and he was the same man where a woman who caught in adultery or, or a woman in sin would be brought, and he would show mercy to her. And, and she saw that's what a man is. A man isn't somebody who has to walk around with hair in his chest and, and gold chains and drive his new Corvette. That isn't necessarily a man. That's a man who's going through a midlife crisis, but that's not a man. A man is somebody who knows who he is, 
I'm a man shaped in the image of Jesus Christ, and I want to be like him, and I'm going to love my wife, even if it means that I have to give up things that, that I want for myself. But I'm going to do that because I'm a man. I'm going to be a man. And that's what we need today. We need it. You're, you're, if you've got kids, your kids need that. They need to see the picture of a real man and what a real husband is like. And so we love our wives. We sacrifice. We give them the word of God and live it in such a way that she knows that we're serious. She can come to you and she can ask you Bible questions. In 1 Corinthians 14, 35, Paul said concerning wives and husbands, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. We need to be equipped to be able to answer their questions. So spend time with her in the Bible. Spend time with her in fellowship. Learn to pray with her. Spend time in devotions. Live out God's word. It, it, it not only blesses, but it saves from so many arguments. There, there are times when a husband says, but my wife won't listen to what I'm saying. Uh, that I will guarantee you, you're not having devotions. I'll guarantee you that you and she are not together in the word together. Guaranteed. Because if you and she open up the Bible together and say, let us pray and agree that whatever God says we together will do, you're going to save a lot of arguments. Because if there's an argument, it's going to be with the Lord and his word, not your opinions. It'll be between that person and God's word. And if you agree to do what God says, you're going to grow. In verse 29, he goes on, he says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So love, the love that we have, as a husband, it nourishes, it cherishes. The word nourish means to bring to maturity. It speaks of nurturing. To cherish it speaks of keeping warm with tender love. Cherishing implies concern, tenderness, a recognition of frailty. So a husband, love your wife in a gentle, tender, and considerate manner. As we become more seasoned in life, we can appreciate and love them more deeply. And the more things we experience together, the greater our bond of love grows. Now think about it. You begin this marriage by, by dating. You pick her up. You, you learn things about her. Uh, she learns things about you. These are things that, that, that she'll decide whether she likes you or not just by seeing you often. And, and you learn things. And she learns. Uh, I, I'll give you an example. She learns what you like, what you don't like. Uh, I, I was living in Norwalk. Marie was living here in, in this area. She's born and raised in Chino. She was living in the city of Ontario at that time. And I would drive 40 minutes, 45 minutes to come pick her up for a date. And I remember coming to pick her up and when we, we were going to go out to the movies. And when we came, I, I came into her house and she had two roommates. And I came into her apartment and, and I, I said, you ready? She said, yeah. And she turns to her roomies and she says, you guys want to go? And they said, oh, yeah. And they go off in the room to get something. And I turned to Marie. We were, we were only dating maybe two months. I turned to Marie, and I smile at her. I said, oh, you know, I, I have something in my car. You want to go with me to get it? Sure. And I still remember walking out with her, and I said, now, let me tell you something. Now, she doesn't know me from Adam. I said, let me tell you something. I did not drive 45 minutes to go out with Vicky and Joni. I drove 45 minutes to go out with you. So do me a favor. Don't be inviting people to go with us on our date <laughs> unless you feel like taking them out and I'll just go home. I don't like that. Now isn't that nice? Isn't that a sweet Pastor David moment? No. <laughs> I, had, I had to learn but she needed to learn me. She needed to learn this will not fly with me. This will not work with me. And guess what? She put up with it. She said to herself, I can work with that. And that's just from the beginning. So you start dating. After you start dating, you, you grow to love another. When, when I asked Marie to marry me, I invited the uh, members of the Bible study that we that I used to teach. I invited them to come on a Friday night 
And I said, can you go to my brother's apartment where the study used to be? And so several of them were able to come. And I still remember that Marie was seated where she always was seated. She would always sit right next to me. Right here, I'd sit in a chair. She always sat just next to me like that. And I read Proverbs 31. And I said to her, uh, you know, the virtuous woman, and I said to her, Marie, this is you. I said, this is you. I said, and I want to ask you, will you marry me? And I had this ring here that I, some of you have seen it if you've ever, it's just a little ring here. Some people think it's an expensive ring. It was the ring my father gave to my mother. It cost him 57 cents. That's how much this ring cost. My mama said, you know that ring? That's the ring that your father gave to me when he asked me to marry him. And so this ring that I just showed you is the ring I handed to her. It's the ring that my son Joseph handed to his bride, Karina. It's the ring that my son David handed to his wife, Des. It's the ring that symbolizes our love that will be forever. And so she went through that with me. We got engaged. Then what do you do? You get married and you begin to rent. You know, we rented our apartment. Then you might buy a home and you, then you make it your home. And, and then you have your children and it ruins everything. And then, <laughs> then, then you raise them and then you release them. And, and then perhaps if you live long enough, they have their, their grand, they have children, you have your grandchildren. These are all memories that you're burying in your heart together. You, you bury your, your parents. You, 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 you just have a life, lifetime. And you want to you look back at that and you want to say, it was worth it. It was worth it. All that we've gone through, all that we've learned. I was channel surfing and I, I've never seen the movie. I can't even tell you what the name of it is. All I know is I was, years ago now, channel surfing. And, and some of you may have seen the movie. I don't know what it's called. But I stopped because it, it connected with me instantly. It, it was an, there was an older Mexican couple in a kitchen. And the wife reminded me of what my mom would do. So I stopped because she was standing next to the stove like my mom would do, and it just connected with me. I saw that. And she was making coffee. There was a time when you actually had a coffee pot that you would put on the stove. It was called a percolator. It would boil the water. The water would come up and go through the grounds and make the coffee. We had that. So I saw that, and it connected like that. I go, wow, that's how I was raised. So I'm looking at it. And the guy, the older man, could have been my father. He, he, he is similar, looks similar to my dad. And he's sitting at the table, and she's bringing him some coffee, and she puts it in front of him, and I'm just, I was caught by that, because I saw that with my mom and my dad as I grew up. That was their kitchen, and that was my dad, and that was my mom. I mean, I just connected, and I knew something of the movie. I'd heard about it, that they go through hard times through the whole movie, and a lot of sadness, a lot of sorrow. I, I know that, but I but I'm just seeing this last part of it and, and I'm connecting and she sits down across from him and I think it's, I think he says, you know, we've had a good life. Something like that. We've had a good life. And it, excuse me, it hit me, it hit me. We've had a good life. And I, that was Marie and me too. That was my dad and that was my mom. I saw that. They had tough times. They had me. They had tough times. <laughs> they had tough times. A lot of sorrow. A lot of pain. A lot of pain I put them through. A lot of pain. And then I saw myself and I saw my wife. And it hit me. No matter how much tough times you have in Christ, they all turn out okay. They all do. They all do. Everything. Everything. The pain, the sorrow, 
the, the, the times when we didn't have two nickels to rub together. The times when I didn't know what am I going to do to pay for this bill. The time when my son was going bad and, I, and my heart is broken. What am I going to do? How am I going to make it? And the Lord has been there every step of the way, never leaving, never forsaking. And my wife has been there like a backbone to me in times when I needed help. She never put me down. She never said, you can't do it. My wife has said from the beginning, I believe in you. God is going to use you. And that is a Christian marriage where the husband says, by God's grace, I'll do all that I can, honey. I will sacrifice for you. I will give you the word of God. I will cherish you. I will nourish you. I will do all that I can to be the man I'm supposed to be, darling. But we together, we together need to understand that this is about Christ because he goes on and closes with, this is a, a great ministry I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I cherish and nourish myself. I take care of myself. I'm supposed to take care of my wife. And my wife sees me as that man that she can trust and respect. And that's how Christian marriages work. God help us to do that.